Our next speaker is Sean Blakely. He comes from Brighton, another work camp that you should probably visit. It's a really nice one. Very good. Yeah, <laughs> where works as a senior technical architect at Pragmatic, which is a leading agency here in the UK based in, in Brighton. Uh, he discovered WordPress back in 2006 and never looked back. <laughs> and he also worked in the film industry as a sculptor. I want to know more about that. That sounds really interesting. We should talk about okay. this for blockbuster movies that you probably have seen. And today he's going to talk about use cases for the REST API. Please give a warm welcome to Sean. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Good morning. Uh, so I'm going to talk about when to use uh, the REST API. So as Francesca said, my name's Sean Blakely. I'm from Pragmatic, a Brighton-based uh, UK WordPress agency. Uh, I've recently been involved with uh, large enterprise-level Scrum projects, and uh, I've been working with WordPress for about 12 years now or so. So who's this talk aimed at? Well, I'd like to talk about uh, some use cases for the REST API, so some of the cases in which we've uh, used and, and found value in the REST API. I'd also like to talk about why I think the REST API is important. I'd then like to talk about uh, a, a sort of a, an overview of what an API is, so a very brief flyover of what APIs are, and then start digging into when to use the API and use some examples of when we've used the API. And then very briefly, we'll look at tomorrow, so some of the uh, impact that I think the, the REST API will have for, for WordPress going forward and into the future. So why is the API, the REST API, important? Well, I think it's important for two groups. I think it's important for us as a community, and obviously a lot of the community is made up of developers. And then secondly, I think it's important for the WordPress project itself, so WordPress as a, as a, as a platform. So prior to the API, WordPress was a, a, a monolithic application. So it was a, a sort of black box where nothing really came into the system, Nothing was really able to get out of the system, and it controlled that publishing flow really from sort of an end-to-end -end control, so from beginning to end. Now, the API changed that. What the API did, uh, the REST API, is that it allowed data to start coming into WordPress, so it allowed data to start coming into the, into the system, but it also allowed data to start flowing out of the system. And so what this did was really sort of a, a twofold. So it liberated our data. It meant that we could start moving data in and out of WordPress. But it also liberated WordPress itself that we could start integrating with other systems and start integrating and becoming part of a larger architecture. And secondly, why uh, I feel anyway that the, the, the REST API is important for the WordPress project. Well, this is the, the dominance that WordPress has currently over other CMSs. So it would seem counterintuitive that WordPress, that the REST API should be important to WordPress uh, for its success and continuing success to thrive or even survive. But in fact, this very dominance potentially makes WordPress vulnerable. And that comes from some ideas introduced by uh, Clayton Christensen. And he was talking about when uh, a software or a company <laughs> dominates the market in this, to this degree, it actually becomes vulnerable to those smaller, more nimble, more agile um, participants who can innovate much quicker than, uh, than this <laughs> dominant party and so start challenging that dominant position and, and challenging that, that key sort of position. So the answer to this and the way of addressing this, uh, what's called the innovator's dilemma, is disruptive innovation. Now, disruptive innovation is starting to challenge your own position. So that position of dominance that WordPress has within the CMS space at the moment, to overcome that potential vulnerability to, to more nimble uh, and, and quicker iterating uh, organizations, uh, is to start challenging itself and challenging its own uh, position via disruptive innovation. And that's exactly what the API is doing. The REST API is starting to challenge us as a community to start innovating within WordPress. And I would suggest that Gutenberg is exactly the same thing. It's starting to challenge ourselves to innovate uh, and, and to move, move forward with our, with our software. So what is an API? Let's have a quick sort of top level uh, look at what an API is. So, I often like to think of an API as an electricity supply. So in and of itself, it really doesn't do very much. You can turn it on, and it just sort of silently sits there. 
It's really what you can sort of plug into that electricity that is really sort of uh, diverse and awe-inspiring and, and empowering. But the API itself is the electricity supply. Now, I'm about to visit Guatemala in a couple of weeks. My wife is Guatemalan, which in turn means that my father-in-law is Guatemalan. Now, I was thinking, uh, as I'm sort of preparing for this trip, I was thinking about the API in these terms, that my father-in-law doesn't speak a word of English, so I can't uh, communicate, or I struggle to communicate with my father-in-law. And conversely, my Spanish is criminally bad, so I can't uh, communicate in, at all in, in Spanish. So my father-in-law has something that I'm very interested in, and that's uh, Guatemalan culture or Latin American culture. So I'm interested in the, the music and the food and the piñatas and all the other things that are enriching about the, the Latin culture. And conversely, I have things that he's interested in. So he's interested in English culture, and that might be uh, warm beer and fish and chips. And, uh, and he's obsessed with it. He thinks we're all pirates for some reason. <laughs> so unfortunately, my, my poor wife is a sort of a conduit between my father-in-law and myself. So she has to translate from one to the other, and this is the only way that we can access information and the, the information that we want to pull from, from each other. Now, this is kind of like an API, but I think we can do it a little better here. So let's imagine that my father-in-law and I uh, resolve to learn a shared language, and so let's suggest that that's Pigeon Esperanto. So now we have this, we've introduced this third language into the mix, and we might not speak very much of this language, but we, as long as we, we've agreed, we've shared that, that information between us, so we're share, sharing that pidgin Esperanto, well, now we can communicate in that shared language. And so my wife can put her feet up, and we can start communicating together. Now, this is much closer to what and how an API works. So in this example, I might be a WordPress install, and my father-in-law might be a 30-year-old uh, COBOL uh, piece of software. In fact, he might have been around before even PHP was, was created. However, because we have this shared Pigeon Esperanto, and it's actually JSON in, in, in the REST API, we can communicate and we can share information. So let's have a, a look at when to use the REST API and look at some examples of when we've used the REST API. And what I'd like to do is, is sort of hone down on two particular areas. So I'd like to look at architecture, and we're going to look at some examples of, of using the REST API as a tool within our architecture. And then we'll look at data, and we're going to look at some data manipulation using the REST API. So first, I'd like to look at using the REST API to enable us to use WordPress as part of an overall solution within an architecture. So this is an example. This is a a sports organization which we're uh, just about to embark uh, working with. And what they'd like to do is uh, utilize the standard publishing flow of, of WordPress. So uh, the content team will be creating content within, the web, within WordPress and then pushing out in a, a familiar format into a PHP template. However, they also want to ingest news and information. This happens to be a, an API, but it's, it's not via the, the, re, the WordPress REST API, ingesting news into the system. They then want to curate that news, so they want to decide which news they're going to push forward and publish on their platform, and they'll lightly summarize it and sort of you know, wrap it in their own uh, summary and information. Now, this is a, a proposal for an MP, MVP structure, but it presents us with a problem, and there's probably a couple of problems. So the first is a performance. So Getting WordPress to do this heavy lifting, so ingesting the API, ingesting that data, whilst also, incidentally, it's running uh, a subscription sort of uh, area over here, and it's also running an e-commerce area over here. And so we're really starting to put pressure on WordPress as our, our key component of our architecture. And so there's actually probably a better way of doing this, and that's to offload some of that heavy lifting to another resource. And that's likely to be a, a, a Node.js script running, which what it will do is ingest that content. So rather than coming directly into WordPress, it'll ingest the content into a content API. That will be cached content. So we'll be able to call that content into WordPress when the content team uh, decide to, to ingest that into WordPress. They can then enrich it within WordPress. So within the WordPress interface, the graphical interface, there'll be uh, adding taxonomies and metadata and all that other enrichment, and then pushing to the front end. And it's likely that 
what we'll do is push into a, a restricted area of the content API. So we'll create a sort of a published area of the content API. And then conversely, our front end can pull that data down from the content API. And it can also be pulled down from other services. So it can be a newsletter and, and apps and, and so on. So as you can see, this portion of our architecture is separate from WordPress. And whilst we're sort of engaging with WordPress and WordPress <laughs> is communicating with this dedicated area, it's not doing the heavy lifting. Let's have a look at uh, another approach. So this is using WordPress as an API delivery system. Now, this was for an organization who are uh, making available information about every single swimming pool across the globe. So they have swimming pools uh, in every major city and hotel swimming pools and uh, you know, sort of public, public baths. And there's information around, you know, is it child friendly or pet friendly? I didn't even know if that's a thing. Uh, is it you know, the opening hours? Can you, you know, book in advance and all that kind of good stuff? So what they wanted to um, benefit from is the sort of st that standard WordPress publishing flow. So they wanted to interact with the graphical interface of WordPress, the back end. They would then push that data into WordPress. Now, the difference with, with this implementation is that there was no website at the front end of this implementation. So what they wanted was a publicly queryable API. So this information could be pulled into uh, widgets, could be pulled into other sites and other sort of data sources around the, the internet. And so all that was available was the data, the pure data via an API feed. Now, this was a good fit for WordPress using it as a delivery system because we weren't doing anything else. There's no subscription, the e-commerce, and all the other things we were talking about previously. The system wasn't doing anything else but delivering uh, an API and delivering the data. However, there were still some performance issues that we faced, and there were still some improvements that we felt we could make. So there was a couple of things that we did. One was uh, introduce Elasticsearch. So Elasticsearch is, is a, a flat data storage, so... Uh, it distributes your, your data into a, a cluster and shards into clusters so you can retrieve sort of lightning quick queries. It's very good at uh, multiple query points, so all those filters around dog-friendly pools or whatever we were talking about, that's what you can do with Elasticsearch, those unique sort of queries. So we introduced this Elasticsearch layer, which gave us that data performance returning the API. We also introduced an accelerator plugin. So this is a, a little must-use plugin that we wrote that enabled us to bypass the standard WordPress boot system. So the sort of boot sequence in WordPress is even if you're serving up an API, it's going to load the whole sort of boot sequence that will load into your theme and your plugins and so on. So we built a little bypass uh, must use plugin that would just ascertain that it was an API call. And of course, in this model, everything is an API uh, request. And then we would sort of send it uh, send it into this uh, plugin, this must-use plugin, that would then bypass all of the plugins, the, the sort of, yeah, the plugin array, and push it straight to the API constructor, so the endpoint constructor. So as you can see, we were using WordPress as the solution, but we were sort of building and enhancing some of those elements within WordPress. Let's have another, uh, a look at another example. So this is integrating systems. Now, this example is uh, Fairfax. Fairfax are a large... Australian publishing company. And this is a project that uh, Human Made recently embarked on where they have an existing content API. So they have a million plus uh, existing sort of articles and, and data pieces. And so they have a media API serving up their uh, images, media, and so on. And then the content API, which is actually receiving information. So again, you're seeing that similar model where we're ingesting information from somewhere else. So this is uh, the wires or the press association or, or Australian equivalent pulling data into the content API and then the existing sort of a media API. Now, what Fairfax wanted was that they, they wanted their, their journalists, uh, their editors and other uh, employees to benefit from WordPress and benefit from that graphical interface uh, that WordPress offers on the back end and also part of that sort of publishing flow. And so they wanted to integrate with those existing architecture and integrate with these existing APIs. And that's exactly what they did. They allowed the, the, the journalists to start pulling 
data and articles down from the content API. So they could uh, create data in the normal flow, so the, the normal sort of publishing flow that we'd all recognize as you're constructing and creating an article. Or they could pull articles down and refine them from this content API. They'd then set them to preview, and that would uh, trigger, and there was a Slack integration where it, it triggers to an editor that there's a, an article that's ready for review. And so the editor then pulls that down and they, they pull it down to, into WordPress. They can then enrich it so they can be adding the meta and the taxonomies and spelling errors and images and all that, all that good stuff. And then pushing that back into a, a new area of the content API, so a published area of the content API, similarly to what we saw before. And then that in turn is being pulled into to React, into a React front end. And interestingly, when we're talking about that integration, so really wanting their employees to have that benefit from the WordPress interface, but it might be connecting with other services that, that weren't originally intended. And the Media API is a really good example of this because the journalists can upload their images to WordPress, so in our, our sort of media uploader in the normal way. However, they get sort of hijacked, if you like, by the Media API, and it pushes out to a, a cloudinary service. Uh, so it doesn't actually reside within the WordPress install. So let's have a, a look at data and data manipulation. And I like to think that data manipulation with the API is as easy as pi. And so what I mean by that is that presenting and integrating and experimenting with data. And this is really what the, the REST API allows us to do. So let's have a look at some, some examples of these three areas. So this is a, a plugin that I've been working on recently. This is a plugin called Site in Numbers. And what this plugin allows you to do is uh, start drawing out big data from your website. So it's intended to be sort of uh, allow the, the site owner to pull out big data visualization opportunities around uh, the sort of total word count on the site or the, the total read time. It might be uh, the publishing uh, days of the week that you publish on, even down to the sort of times that comments uh, are made. And so really starting to enable the site owners to see patterns in their own data as well as their potential uh, audience to see patterns in the, in the data. So the way that we've structured this is it's, it's sort of threefold. So it has uh, an admin interface. This is the interface for the site owner. So here they can sort of select the sections that they want to add to display on the front end or, or sections that they want to pull out. Then in turn, it has uh, the API construction layer. So this is where we pull together, start constructing all those statistics, start constructing all that information and then creating this JSON data object. So this large uh, object of data that is then pulled into the front end. So this is a JavaScript layer. It's pulling that JSON information in, and then it's distributing those statistics, those numbers, into the relevant places around the site. But then also, as you can see, it's using Chart.js to start constructing charts, so presenting that information in, in different and varied ways. So this is really where... The heavy lifting is being done on the, uh, on the server side. So WordPress is doing the heavy lifting, constructing that, that data, that big JSON object. And then the processing is being done in the JavaScript and processing that information that comes through. Let's have a look at another project. This is a project called IM Team GB. This is a project we did for ITV, uh, the British Olympic Association, and the National Lottery. And among many things that we had to do for this project, one of the things was uh, we had to provide an inbox, uh, uh, sorry, an input box where you could put your location, so it might be your postcode or your city of, of uh, residency, and then we'd show uh, events that were relevant to you, and we'd show them within distance order from your front door. So we had many thousands of events that were being created that were actually being ingested in from another system, again, via the REST API. And so we'd have those events, and then we'd be, be needing to, to show the, the relevant uh, events to that individual and where they've searched from. So this is how we did it. Again, we relied on, on WordPress as our interface. We were actually ingesting those events into this uh, WordPress site. And I pulled out the JavaScript layer here because when we put in, and so in that example, I'm putting Brighton in, which is my hometown, that's then firing uh, an API request to Google Maps, and so looking for the longitude and latitude, trying to, uh, and so we might get an error back if we're not UK based. Um, we get that longitude and latitude back into the JavaScript layer. JavaScript is then via the API, via the REST API, 
making a request back to our system. And what we've done is we've split the UK into four sections. And the reason that we've done that, and we've split it into four endpoints, the reason that we've done that is because we're dealing with large uh, quantities of data, and so we need to make that data manageable. And we need to sort of narrow down our focus as to what data set we're bringing back. So we did some calculations, and four was about the right number. Um, and so the system would ascertain where your longitude and latitude, which sort of pot of these, uh, the sort of region that we should be pulling that data back from. So in this example, it's number three. We pull that data back via the API. And in this instance, the JavaScript layer is probably doing quite a lot of the heavy lifting because we get this great big unordered uh, JSON data object back, and then the JavaScript has to sort uh, those events and calculate the distance from your front door and then present it to the user. And obviously, all of that needs to be done in lightning quick time. So let's have a look at another example. This is integrating. Now, the interesting thing about using the REST API to integrate systems and integrate with systems is that different software and different clients have different definitions of what integration means. And so it's really important to define what's meant by integration and what we're trying to achieve by integration. Now, a great example of this uh, is Sage. Now, we're working with, with Sage, the financial, uh, global financial company. And this is from the Sage uh, homepage. So this is a, a Sitecore site. So Sitecore is a .NET content management system. But the content that you're seeing isn't coming from Sitecore. It doesn't reside within Sitecore. This is coming from a WordPress site. And it's actually coming from uh, Sage Advice, which is uh, the blog section of the Sage ecosystem, and that's built in WordPress. So how is this information coming across, and what is this integration? Well, through discussions with, with Sage, we were talking to uh, a number of sort of stakeholders across Sage, and that was uh, including the sort of tech teams and other, other um, uh, participants within the organization. It became clear that for, for Sage, integration meant displaying, contextualized information in the right place. So it's about being able to pull the right information in and then display it anywhere around the Sage ecosystem. So that's exactly what we did. What we did is we created a custom endpoint, so an endpoint where anywhere within the Sage ecosystem they could pull contextualized data and pull information in and then display it within, the, within that sort of space within the ecosystem. And incidentally, uh, as you're seeing on the end of this uh, endpoint, we have a number of filters. And these are also really important because this was an opt-in. So you could add, and indeed they do, add as, uh, as little information as they want. So our uh, relevancy is, is, is quite low. They might just add the category. Or they can start turning up that relevancy. So you know, really start adding the tags and other taxonomies that, that are available and so getting really uh, relevant results um, depending on the information they provide. Because behind here resides a relevancy engine. Uh, engine. So where, uh, when you hit this endpoint, that data comes in, so that request comes in, and then the system starts allocating points. Uh, if you get a, a tag match, you get a point, and then if you match the categories, you might get three points, and et cetera, et cetera. And so it's really sort of constructing a, a league table of... Uh, relevancy for the different posts around the system, and then we know that we're returning just the most relevant results back to wherever that request has come. Now, what this enables us to do is start making all these connections between the different systems. So what you're seeing here, this is a Sitecore site, and this is a WordPress site, but because we're creating this interconnectivity, what we're doing is creating a, a deeply integrated user experience. There is no friction as somebody moves from Sitecore into WordPress and back again. And indeed, they don't know that they're moving between systems. And that's by using the REST API and our approach, and so allowing all those touch points between the two different systems. So let's have a look at experimenting. Um, one of the things we mentioned before is that you know, one of the real value of the, the REST API is it allows us to start innovating and challenging our, ourselves and experimenting. So, Here's some examples of some experiments that we've been working on. Now, this is a, a recent thing that I've been playing with. This is Ionic, and this is uh, an integration with WordPress. So Ionic can create a, a, a native app, can compile into a native app. 
and, uh, but its data source, where it's pulling that data from, is WordPress. Now, this is fully CRUD, so what that means is I can create and edit and delete information from the Ionic interface, and it will actually persist down into the WordPress site. So as you can see, I'm adding Charles to Charles Darwin there. And if we come back to the WordPress site, so the data site that sits behind it, you'll see that that change has actually persisted into the WordPress site. Now, this is really exciting because it enables us to start thinking of our, our content as dynamic and it can start being affected and changed from around an entire ecosystem. And this is just one example where it's being changed via Ionic over here on a, a mobile, but it could be anywhere within an ecosystem. And so we can really start thinking of our data as fluid and WordPress is just sort of the storage vessel for that data and we're affecting it across a larger ecosystem. Let's have another look, or a look at a, a different example. So this was where, uh, this is where we sort of challenged ourselves to start thinking about WordPress in a different way. So, you know, what could we do creatively with WordPress, and particularly around the REST API, you know, what would it enable? And so what I was thinking about was as a games engine. I've never thought about WordPress as a games engine. So I was thinking about how would you do that? How would you go about that? And so what I'd settled on was a, a football simulation, or a soccer simulation for our international friends. Um, and so you would be able to uh, think of like a turn-based game, so you'd be starting to run that relationship and a progression of time. So there's a couple of things. One was, uh, as you can see, there's sort of shadow taxonomies here. So uh, shadow taxonomies are uh, taxonomies that don't really persist onto the front end, so we're just using them to create uh, sort of one-to-many or many-to-many -many, uh, network connections of data. So if you think a, a sort of football match may have a, a clubs and it may have players and players may have agents and so on and so forth. So there's lots of interrelationships between that network. So that was one element of it. But then the other was a, a time engine. So thinking about the progression of time and how we could build that within a WordPress space and indeed using the REST API. So that's exactly what we did. We created Herbert after HG Wells and Herbert is a, a time machine that is essentially passing on time, so the passage of time is moving on, and Herbert is controlling events that are happening in that space. So there might be certain events which are clock stopping, which uh, stop the passage of time, and then other events which just persist in the background and they're updating the user. So we're still very early, but that idea, that notion of using WordPress and using the REST API to start constructing WordPress and manipulating data in an entirely different way it's a very interesting approach and certainly something that we've enjoyed thinking about WordPress in this different way. So let's have a look at a, a, a more immediate example. Um, so this is the Gutenberg interface. Uh, uh, well, it was the Gutenberg interface a couple of days ago. It might have changed by now, but uh, in fact, Zach's probably talking about that right now. Um, so I've been interested for a while in the impact of Gutenberg and what it's going to mean to us all. And one of the things that I was, have been interested in a while is that in WordPress we have this, the, the great big content area and it's this, this great big sort of imposing area that is impenetrable that we can't really get into the information that's in that content area. Now, of course, Gutenberg is, is changing that. It's turning our content into discrete blocks. So we're going to be able to uh, start constructing and building out sort of you know, pages from these, these sections. And so what it enables us to start thinking about is potentially drilling down to that information. And so rather than just accessing a post uh, and, and sort of accessing information at that level, we can actually start drilling down and looking at individual blocks within the content. So what I've been thinking about is where we have post tags. So post tags is where we tag at post level. We can start thinking about adding uh, content tags. And so content tags might be tagging individual blocks. You might have a paragraph about uh, some sort of you know, uh, topic over here and then an image and a post over here and you know, a, a bullet point list over here. But what if we use our content tags, we can start forming those relationships as we've been talking about before, that, that network of relationships between data. And so then we can start constructing these dynamic pages, which is pulling related content together and really allowing us to modularize our content. So as we developers often modularize our constructions, so we, we modularize our sort of SAS files and our JavaScript files. 
Well, this is one approach where we might start being able to modularize our content and actually pulling it out and showing related and relevant content. So I'd just like to say uh, a few words around performance, just some, some sort of things that we found when using the REST API. So the first is um, around transients and, and using the transients API. I have to be careful. Obviously, we're, we're talking about the REST API. A transients API, WordPress has a number of APIs, and the transient API uh, is a really useful one. Transients are uh, database storage. They're ways of caching uh, data objects now. They're very useful for something like uh, the REST API. So if we're making requests and we're requesting data um, that may be persistent and other users are requesting, then we can construct it into a, a transient, and then it will cache it within the database, and we're going to get a much quicker response time. So as you can see here, we were hitting about five seconds or so. Drop that into a transient, and we're getting a huge slash. I don't know if you could read that, but by you know, we're down to sort of 0.4, 0.5 seconds. Now, there is a caveat with transients, and it's really uh, a use case that you need to, to be aware of. So if you have a, a high-traffic site, they are temporary storage, and so uh, your user may go to the transient, and it doesn't exist. And if the transient doesn't exist, then WordPress constructs the, the transient for the user. However, that's true for all users. So if you have 20, 30 concurrent users, then they're all going to be constructing that same transient, putting huge pressure on the on database and on resources. There are a few ways around this, but one is uh, asynchronous transients, which is the plugin which I suggest looking at if you have those sort of racing conditions and, and big high traffic. Now, the other thing that we did uh, and that I'd recommend, and we mentioned this before, is the accelerator plugin or that similar kind of architectural solution. So this was a site that is uh, dedicated to the API, so it's just a delivery system, but by default, it's loading in our theme and our plugins and our other sort of resources. So we use this accelerator plugin, and it simply just bypasses the plugins, and so it just gives us straight to the information that we wanted, and we managed to slash that by about two thirds. So a huge saving just in thinking about how the WordPress boot structure works and then thinking about how we can manipulate <laughs> that, but in a secure way, and so not sort of making any compromises on, on security. Uh, I'm going to make these slides available. I don't expect you to read all those, but these are some dev resources. Uh, indeed, the asynchronous transients and some uh, distributor plugin is a very interesting uh, project at the moment. So there's some bits and pieces there. I've also uh, put together some other resources. So there's a white paper and uh, see the Slack channel is a, a very active channel around the API. So what I'd, I'd like to sort of leave you with is, is just thinking about tomorrow and where the, the, a, the REST API is sort of taking us tomorrow. So for me, I think we've opened up this opportunity, and it's an opportunity to be uh, innovative, to sort of challenge our, our, ourselves as a community, in particular as a, a development community, and really start thinking about um, the, the sort of integrations and, and the opportunities that being able to have access to our data anywhere and, and different sort of services and different solutions, what those opportunities present us. I mean, it's certainly we can start working and collaborating with different teams and different agencies that may have no relationship with the WordPress space, but the API is allowing us to do that because our data then becomes platform agnostic. The fact that it's originated in WordPress makes no difference because JSON is platform agnostic, so it allows us to start manipulating and moving data around. And so for me, it doesn't really matter where the API goes. We, the REST API may be superseded by other API solutions, but it's really, it's not what's important. What's important is we've enabled that opportunity for the, the community to start moving information and treating data in a very, and thinking about data in a very different way. And so, as we were talking about before, that innovating into new space, that challenging ourselves and challenging that, our own dominance, I think that's exactly what the REST API does. It allows us to start innovating into new space and taking WordPress into places that it certainly hasn't been before. And so, as we were talking about before, as, as uh, the, the API, the REST API as, a, as an electricity supply, well, it's truly inspiring what uh, an electricity supply enables and all the myriad of things that you can do when you're given that power and that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have five minutes for questions. Uh, 
there, thank you, and then here. Thanks. Hi, um, thanks for the talk. Question about the Transient API. Are you using Transient directly, or do you go through WP, Cache, GetSet, etc.? So in our current structure, we're using Transients directly. So we're creating a Transient, and the plugin that I was talking about, the Site and Numbers plugin, is constructing a, a Transient directly. Um, some of the uh, things that we're talking about around the the compromises or potential things that you need to be aware of. And so that's that concurrent racing conditions as you have lots of users starting to construct those transients. So looking at the asynchronous transients, and so what that essentially does is sort of creates a, a fallback transient. So uh, if the transient doesn't exist, you, you go to a, a fallback version, and so you don't have those construction pressures on the system. And for me, currently, that that solution that so sort of overcomes, I think, one of the, the key flaws of, of transients. When you have that fallback, you no longer need to think about other uh, solutions. I think that's a, a good sort of fit for, for, for us. Um, just a related question. How long do you keep the transients, or how long do you say they expire on them? That's a really good question. So just to be clear, transients uh, expire, so they're sort of temporary data storages. Um, and so by default, you normally set an expiry date, and so the transient sort of doesn't persist for too long. I tend not to set the expiry date. So you can actually set a non-expiring transient, and then you can start replacing the same transient. And so as long as you use a naming convention, which is the same name, you don't then have to concern yourself with that expiry date of the, of the Okay, follow up on that. A non-expiring transient is stored in the options table, which is auto-loaded which will uh, put pressure on the memory of your server. Mm -hmm. So um, as a pro tip, do set an expiry date on all transients to not kill your server with lots of transients. Yes. I've, I've run into that. It's not good. I, c I can well imagine. And in fact, I mean, if someone were to, to be talking specifically about transients, there's all sorts of little tips that we you need to be aware of. There are little caveats and gotchas, and there's a really, really good one. Uh, and really important one, so yes, I mean, that's very sage advice. You do need to be mindful when using transients that there are consequences to, to your actions. We have another question here. Thank you. Here. Thank you. Uh, you spoke a lot about the performance problem. Uh, so my question is from someone that doesn't uh, uh, got inside uh, this matter deeply in the past, but looking from the outside, do you think it's preventing uh, this API system to be widely uh, spread and used? And do you think in the future that the uh, WordPress core will improve this uh, issue? It's a, it's a really good question. I mean, so the, the problem that we're trying to overcome with that accelerator plugin uh, is we're trying to bypass that boot sequence that WordPress buzz, does by default. And that's an obvious quick win, because if we're going to use WordPress in a different way, and so as a delivery system, then there really is no need to be sort of loading all this information that's not, that's not going to be utilized. Um, I mean, it is, it is a, a, a concern to a degree, or it's certainly something you need to be aware of, but there are all sorts of caching layers that you can introduce so you can start making that more performant. The transits we're talking about is one option to start increasing the, the speed and efficiency of your system. But one of the things we haven't talked too much about today, but is the, the opportunity it gives you to start introducing new uh, front-end uh, libraries and frameworks into your architecture, so things like React and, and Vue and so on. And so the payoff is that you then have this whole other opportunity to start building and structuring things in a different way. And so you can start thinking about the performance, some of the performance savings we can make over here, but this opportunity it presents us to uh, sort of, you know, far outweighs the performance concerns we might have currently um, sort of, you know, over, over here. Thank you, Sean. Uh, this is it for us for this morning. Uh, please, let's give it up. <laughs> Sean. Thank you. Thank you. Lunch uh, is served.